Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the October 2020 Novice Meeting of the Houston Astronomical Society. My name is Joe Califf, the president of HAS, and I'd like to, uh, again, extend a warm welcome to everybody joining us tonight uh, for this presentation. Uh, before we introduce Bill, uh, I wanted to introduce Debbie Moran. Debbie is our novice chairperson and uh, the person who puts all of these wonderful programs together. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Debbie. Debbie, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. And I'd like to thank so much, Bill Kasiri, for being here. Um, every once in a while, I think we're getting a little cabin fever here. Bill has an entire menagerie of astronomy travel talks, and we can always learn a little bit of astronomy along with them. So uh, Bill is from Chicago, joined the Astronomical Society here in Houston a number of years ago. Finally, I think, extricated himself from Chicago, um, only in, in a body, but not in spirit, as you will hear. And so I would like to oh, introduce really? Bill, my favorite speaker, Spitzeri. I say that so much, oh. I just decided to make it your middle name. Um, <laughs> so tonight, Bill is going to talk about uh, visiting Stonehenge and the Royal Observatory at Greenwich in England. Thank you very much, Bill. Go, uh, take it away. OK, thank you, Debbie. Um, Joe, I can go ahead and share my screen. You can. What I was going to tell folks is if you have any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom uh, window there. And what we'll do is uh, cue those. And at the end of the presentation, we'll give a chance for everybody to ask those uh, to Bill individually. So uh, please use that function. You're good to go, Bill. Okay. I'm going to try to hit the correct buttons here. Okay, I assume you see the uh, flag? We do. Okay, all right, very good. Well, thank you for uh, introducing me. Yes, everybody, um, went to England uh, some years ago. You can see the date over there. And uh, you see the flag of England on the screen. And no, you don't. That is not the flag of England. That, of course, is called the Union Jack. It's for the entire uh, United Kingdom. And when I landed in London, all, all over the place, I saw um, Do you see my PowerPoint? We do. Yes, we it do. looks like we're good to go, Bill. With the we Union the Jack. UK flag. With the Union Jack. And Jeez. now you see oh, the Oh, it worked. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, there's a special thing you have to do. It's called reboot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. So that's the England flag. Okay. The reason I went to England, we went there for a family wedding. There's the bride and groom and uh, a player to be named later, I guess. I don't know. We went there for a wedding. And of course, while we're in England, we want to see many tourist attractions. So we saw many things. We saw the, the Parliament on the Thames River. Very nice. We wanted to go see the um, uh, Big Ben, but you cannot see the Big Ben because Big Ben isn't the tower. Big Ben isn't the clock. Big Ben is the bell, apparently, there. So you don't see it. You hear it. So you have to stand on the street and wait till it's uh, five o'clock or whatever. And then you get to hear the Big Ben. So that's a little bit of England trivia for you. Mm. Uh, we also went to see a Shakespearean play in the Globe Theater. This is not the Globe Theater because that burned down, but they built a replica. This is not the replica. Even this is a model of it, which uh, they have there at the replica. And I couldn't help but adding a couple of, you'll see there are quotes from uh, Shakespearean plays. I uh, had to do with astronomy. Uh, not from the stars do I my judgments pluck and yet me thinks i have astronomy uh, shakespeare said that okay all right fine uh he i guess paid attention to astronomy a little bit all right and then of course you got the british museum i've been there for centuries the rosetta stone which is you know a proclamation in three languages so we learned how to uh, read hieroglyphics and um and then of course then uh they got the you got the funny uh, phone booths okay and uh, just there, I don't even think they're connected. They were there so you can take selfies, all right? And uh, you got the Roman baths that were there, uh, you know, centuries ago, millennium ago. And where are they located? They're located in Bath. Uh, what a coincidence that is that the Roman people decide to put their baths in a town called Bath. I, that's amazing, okay? Uh, actually, that's not true. They named the town after the Roman baths. Anyway, uh, okay, so, uh, and then after that, we go to Westminster Abbey. And uh, it's, of course, an abbey. It's a church. There's church services there on a regular basis. But it is also, I don't know how else to say this, but it's an indoor uh, cemetery. There's kings and queens of it been buried there for a thousand years. And uh, here's pictures. And I believe the phrase is they don't make them like they used to. The place is absolutely beautiful. 
But like I said, it's an indoor cemetery, and there's a lot of notable scientists uh, buried in Westminster. Ernest Rutherford, uh, famous for several things, but he discovered the proton, kind of discovered the nucleus of the atom, and he is in the floor in Westminster Abbey. Um, you might have heard of this guy, a bi biology guy, Charles Darwin. He is uh, important enough to get in Westminster. And uh, then they have this memorial to Edmund Halley. And he's not buried there, but they have this memorial there celebrating all of the things that he did. He was, you know, he was uh, knighted. And uh, what you see the picture there is a spacecraft that visited Halley Comet back in 85, 86. And uh, if you look at all those things listed there, the second one from the bottom as is uh, related to what we'll, I'll be talking about later. It says he is his researches in determining longitude. And when you talk about Royal, uh, the, the observatory in Greenwich, uh, that's all about longitude. We'll talk about that more later. And then of course, you might've heard of this guy, Isaac Newton. Uh, he is buried in Westminster also. And when they bury me, I want a headstone like that. That's um, dynamite, okay? Uh, you got to be somebody to get one of those and you got to be somebody to get buried in Westminster. Okay. But what I'm here to talk about, as Joe mentioned, is old astronomy. And uh, we're going to start with the Royal Observatory Greenwich uh, of here to four known as ROG. Okay. And uh, first I will tell you where it's located. So uh, you see the yellow word London there. Um, all that gray stuff under the word London, that's London proper. And then you can see where ROG is. It's uh, not very far out of uh, downtown London, if you will, on the Thames River. You take the tube, their underground subway. Well, all subways are underground, right? You take the tube from London to the observatory. I don't know, 20 minutes. Didn't take very long. So that's where it is. Uh, and then the observatory is on a hill in, in this park, uh, Greenwich Park. And uh, the big white building you see is the Maritime Museum there, who technically owns uh, ROG now. And uh, I walk through that park. If I get to show the video later, if, we, if it works properly, uh, you'll see a little bit more of the park. It's a huge, huge park. Uh, this is just a small piece of it. And it's notable that, uh, as you can see there on the left, a French anarchist um, uh, was succumbed when the bomb he was exploded, I assume, prematurely. Uh, as he was walking through the park. And I mentioned it because there was some speculation that he was headed for the observatory with the bomb. But that, of course, the French anarchist was unavailable for comment afterwards, if you know what I mean. And so we're just guessing about that. But that's Greenwich Park. Okay, so the observatory. The reason the observatory exists, as far as uh, the people at the time who built it would say, is because of something called the longitude problem. <clears throat> what that means is, England is an island, uh, and they also had an empire, which means they need a big navy, and they're not just going to be uh, uh, sailing from London to Scotland. They're going to be going ocean, open ocean sailing, and they need accurate navigation to do that. Now, as astronomers, you probably know figuring out your latitude is easy. If you can see the sun or if you can see the North Star, you can figure out your latitude is no big deal. Uh, longitude is not easy. <clears throat> uh, uh, they wanted to be able to do the ocean navigating, to be able to determine their longitude out in the middle of the ocean to within a half of a degree. They thought that was needed to do the navigation. And they said, okay, if we know the sky well, uh, the, the sky, you know, the motion of the objects in the sky is really due to the, the revolution of the earth and rotation of the earth. And of course, that is the definition of time, the rotation of the earth that determines the day and the hour, et cetera. So if we know the sky, we'll know the time. And, uh, but they said also we're going to have to, uh, if we, we know the time, then we can compute the longitude. So they also needed accurate clocks that would work at the, uh, on the, the rough and tumble sea. All the clocks back then use pendulums. They just don't work in, in 10, 15 foot swells out in the ocean. The pendulums get all out of whack, they don't work. So King Charles II said, we got to build an observatory. Okay. So that's why they built the ROG. Okay, so here's a picture of the first building. Uh, the, so this is just the residence for the Astronomer Royal or the Royal Astronomer, however you want to say it, built in 1676. It's called Flamsteed Hall. The first astronomer there, John Flamsteed, you see him on the left. Um, and 
this is there's not there's no observatory here. This is his home, his kitchen, his bathroom, a few work rooms, uh, servants' quarters, and things like that. That's this Flamsteed Hall. And then the interesting part about it is the big orange ball on the roof. And ever since 1833, that orange ball sits where you see it all, all the time. And then at 12:55 p.m., that orange ball uh, travels up that bla uh, black post to the top just under the weather vane. And then at one o'clock, it's lowered. And the reason they did that is because, um, as I mentioned, the observatory is very near the Thames River. The, the uh, ships would be docked on the Thames River. They would, they would watch um, from their ships for when that orange ball came down. They'd do it at one o'clock. They would set their chronometer or whatever they have on the ship, and they could go their merry way. So that's how um, uh, that's how they communicate. That's one of the ways they communicated time to the Navy once they started things uh, rolling here. Um, here is a, a photograph when they were building it. Uh, you see the time ball is already up on the top there. Um, and uh, uh, John Flamsteed, uh, uh, horoscopes were very big back in those days. So he developed a horoscope for the observatory, uh, put it in the uh, cornerstone, and insisted he did not believe in that stuff at all. It was just a thing to do back then. And so he put in with the horoscope this note that says, can you keep from laughing, my friends? So he didn't believe it, but he did it, that it's in the cornerstone, and I don't think anyone's ever opened it up, but um, supposedly that's in there. Okay, so as I mentioned, they are trying to, uh, oh, there's one building inside, uh, excuse me, one room in, in uh, Flamsteed Hall that is, is notable. And that is the so-called octagon room because of its shape. Uh, back when it was built, they called it the great star room. <clears throat> you, of course, have the obligatory pictures, uh, paintings of the kings and some other important uh, big shot uh, along with the king there. And if you look under the portrait, you'll see the two clocks. There's a bit closer picture on the right. These were made by Mr. Tompion, who was the premier clockmaker back in those days. <clears throat> And it was at the time the most accurate clock in the world. You know, it's just part of the process of the ROG uh, uh, being able to tell time well. And behind the paintings of the king, you've got a 13 foot, uh, actually two 13 foot pendulums. Uh, and um, that's, I guess, part of why those clocks were so accurate. They were good clocks, big long pendulums. And they were so accurate, you wound them once a year. And they were used uh, by, uh, I don't know if it was Flamsteed or the second astronomer there, to prove that the Earth rotated at a constant rate because the, uh, you know, they were able to just measure the, the, how long it, uh, it took the uh, Earth to rotate with those clocks very accurately. So they had a, uh, a useful purpose. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, here's one of the early uh, photographs and uh, one of the first telescopes. By the way, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Okay, so this uh, diagonal tube here is a 60 foot refractor uh, supported by this 80 foot uh, mast uh, put up there just a few years after the observatory was built. And uh, of course the observatory as it mentioned there is a so-called United Nations UNESCO World Heritage Site. But anyway, you can see in the picture there that was one of the very first telescopes they had at the observatory. And there's been plenty of them and I will be showing you as many of them as I can. Okay, so then, of course, the, the king said, doggone it, we gotta, have, we gotta be able to tell time. So you gotta have a good clock. So the king, guess what? We're gonna give you uh, 20,000 pounds or something like that to whoever can come up with a, a, a good timepiece that would, again, work on, a, on the bouncing sea to a three and a half a degree of longitude. Um, and finally, a fellow named Harrison developed what you see here, which uh, even if it didn't work would be a beautiful piece of art, but he came up with it in 1735. It worked on the sea. And the reason it worked, if you can see my cursor, you have these two pendulums at the top and they are connected with a spring to balance each other out. And then you can see that on the bottom, you can see one of the other pendulums and both of these pendulums have a, 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 another one on the bottom. So there's two more on the bottom connected by springs. And because of all these pendulums and they are connected by springs so they balance each other out, uh, they worked out in the ocean. 
So he got his uh, big money, which, uh, as far as I can calculate, is was worth approximately four million dollars in today's U.S. dollars. So, um, you know, it paid for all of his bronze, I guess, that he put in the uh, clock there. Uh, they have this at the observatory. You can see it. The little lot of museum uh, areas there. It took him six years to do it. And as I researched this, I discovered something I did not know that all the clocks in the world, except pocket watches, which really weren't very accurate, uh, used pendulums until the 1920s. And in the 1920s, they started to time uh, uh, clocks with crystals. As you might have heard, we, a lot of clocks we use crystals. Uh, and that started in the 1920s. But they were all with pendulums, so that's all they had to work with back then. And uh, that's how he got his, uh, that's how he got the, a good timepiece for the, uh, for the Navy. Now, along with that, as I mentioned, they have to learn the sky, so lots of telescopes. Here's one called the Zenith Scope, 12 and a half feet long. Uh, 1727 is when they put it. I think you can figure out why they call it the Zenith Scope. It doesn't move in declination and it doesn't move in right ascension. It just looks up at the Zenith. And so what did they do with that? You know, you, you get all your observing on any given night done pretty quick when you can only look in one spot. Um, they did it so that they could time very carefully when objects cross the, the zenith, which of course is on the meridian, okay? And uh, so it was used uh, again to, as a timepiece really, uh, to time exactly when objects cross the meridian. And uh, because it was really an accurate timepiece, 1748, they discovered Earth's nutation, which is the wobble of the Earth's axis of rotation uh, caused mostly by the moon's gravity. And uh, so it was discovered with this uh, particular telescope. Okay, that's of course not what the observatory is known for. The observatory is known for this, uh, this mark on the ground, which is the, uh, the prime meridian, longitude zero degrees, right over there, right? And as you can see, it passes right into that building, uh, which has this uh, slot cut in it. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. They got a clock here in case you wanna set your watch. And that's the uh, Greenwich Meridian, okay? And uh, so you're required by law to put one foot on the east side and one foot on the west side, one foot in the east hemisphere, and you have somebody take your picture. They don't let you go until you take that picture. That is yours truly, by the way. And if you look up uh, Silly American Tourist in the dictionary, uh, that should be the picture they have there. If it's not, that should be the picture they use. Uh, that's... Uh, uh, the picture speaks for itself. What can I say? So I. Uh, hey, that's what, not you. Yes, it is me. Yes, it is. Yes, I know you're thinking. I know you thought it was Brad Pitt. No, that's me. Okay, we get confused frequently. But there you go. It's a problem. Uh, so, uh, so that's the building with the Prime Meridian, and this is a different view. Now, on the right, you can see the video where I mean the picture where I was standing. And then you can see what they do at that building at night, okay? They open up that hole, the roof and all the slots on the sides. And then that exposes the uh, transit circle telescope, which was the telescope uh, for measuring time and measure, observing the sky at the observatory. And if you look, they cleverly light up the, um, they light up the prime meridian at night. So it looks very groovy. Uh, anyway, okay, so there's the telescope. <clears throat> Here's a close-up of the telescope. As you can see, it's called the transit circle and it does not move in declination. It all, oh, excuse me, it does not move in right ascension. It only moves on declination because this way it's always looking at the meridian at some location on the prime meridian. And again, its purpose is to watch very precisely when objects cross that meridian for timing purposes. It's uh, the objective is a little over eight inches across. Its uh, focal length is uh, 11 and a half feet. And this was the telescope that defined the prime meridian. Uh, it was used for a uh, hundred years. Um, the last observations as it states there was in 1954 and uh, like it only moves in declination. And, uh, and then of course they defined their meridian with this telescope, but it wasn't for several years where the world, believe it or not, the world can't agree on some things just to, just to try to liven up the conversation here. Anyway, uh, and in 1884, they had a big meeting in the United States and uh, all the countries voted and they all agreed 
that that would be the the prime meridian for everybody. That would be longitude zero. Uh, so to avoid confusion, shall we say? Uh, I say everybody except I think France and another country abstained from the vote. Maybe Belgium, and then one country I think it was the Dominican Republic voted no against it. I don't know why. You know, every country wanted their meridian to be the prime meridian, but uh, finally they came to agreement. So that's the telescope that uh, defined the uh, meridian. Right outside the observatory, if you look on the ground, you can see uh, that metal strip there. That's, again, the prime meridian. They have this sculpture here. Uh, uh, it's just a little astronomy sculpture. The uh, long vertical pointer is pointing right at the North Star. So the, uh, this uh, ellipse over here, this circle is the celestial equator. And of course, uh, <clears throat> since it's pointed at the North Star, it's telling you what your latitude is. So it's on the prime meridian, you know where your longitude is <coughs> and uh, you know your latitude. So just a little interesting piece of sculpture that they have there. Now at the front gate of the observatory, they have a clock. It's made by a company called Shepherd, so Shepherd's Gate Clock. It put it there in 1852, and it's electric. And you might say, hey, Bill, you said all the clocks were pendulums. Yes, that's because it, it's kind of electric. There is a master clock inside the observatory, which is a pendulum clock. And every two swings of the pendulum, I think it was every two seconds, it would send, send an electrical impulse to the Shepherd's Gate Clock to make uh, you know, the second hand move. And so, you know, it was sort of electric, but not really. It was just a, a, a slave clock to the master clock inside the observatory. And of course it was at the gate. So even when the place was closed, the public could come. And it was the first place where the public can actually see what GMT was at any given time. And the matter of fact, there were people who would walk to the observatory every day with a little clock, set their clock, walk back into London or wherever, wherever the clockmakers uh, factories were so that the clockmakers could set their clocks or correct their clocks every day. Clocks weren't all that uh, accurate back then. And as I mentioned on the bottom there, it was not changed for daylight savings time. You know, the English isn't gonna mess with that. Uh, and by the way, in England, it's not called that, it's called uh, British summertime. Little British trivia there for you. Okay, so that was how the public can see it. <clears throat> Here is the dome, uh, the biggest dome at the observatory. There is a 28 inch refractor, which I will show you for obvious reasons. I don't know, to me it's obvious. They refer to the dome as the onion. It's uh, just because of the way it looks. It uh, is not the original dome. The original dome for reasons I cannot uh, explain was made out of paper mache. I don't know how, you, you, a lot of you guys have built observatories. I, I'm going to guess a few of them use paper mache, but that's what they did. It uh, got a little damaged in World War II. I'll show you a little bit more of that later, but um, that's the way it looks now. So that's the Onion Dome. And of course, here's another view. You can see the Onion Dome and another dome over there. And I couldn't help but these, look at these guys. They look so good with their wigs and their outfits. Uh, that's Sir Edmund Halley, who we mentioned earlier. Uh, John Flamsteed was the first observ uh, royal observat um, astronomer royal, as they put it, and Edmund Halley was the second one. Okay, so um, so that's where the 28-inch refractor is. Here is a view of it at night, and so you can see the telescope. Uh, um, okay, so that's that. Uh, there we go. Uh, it was put there in 1893. It's, this is inside the Onion Dome there. The objective lens, for reasons which uh, probably don't need explaining, was removed during World War II for safekeeping. Um, it is still the largest refractor in the United Kingdom. And then for several years, it was removed from th this observatory and moved to a, uh, I think I'll mention it later, it was removed and then brought back in the 1970s. And the Queen came there to recommission it. You know, you can't do any observing until the Queen says it's okay, I guess. Um, and the guy on the left there, I think, is saying, hey, I just got Mars in focus. I don't care if the queen's here. I'm not getting up. OK, uh, it's just the way he uh, I don't know. I, he probably wasn't there when the queen was there. It's just uh, my own little caption. That's my guess. OK, so that's the 28 entry factor. Now, I went in and took some pictures. And here's a nice one that's out of focus, but I didn't have uh, the opportunity to take too many. And uh, 
you know, it, this is not used for anything nowadays. I, 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 I don't know what kind of observing plan is used before. It's probably used for something. It's a great telescope, but uh, little or nothing, I believe, nowadays. Uh, here's another picture of it. And as it says there, I had to get uh, written authorization ahead of time uh, to take pictures uh, in there. So a couple of weeks ahead of time, I asked them and they said it was okay. As you can see, here is one axis over here and the other axis over here. And that's how it, how it works. So it's been there for quite some time and a uh, fairly good telescope. Uh, here's a close up. Then this is on almost uh, in focus, I would say. You, of course, can see the state of the art the computers that they had there when I went there. And uh, you probably wouldn't have too much use for this telescope because of its size, but look at this brass finder scope. Uh, th that would be um, a, probably quite a nice telescope to be able to use. Uh, and uh, you can see all these counterweights on the bottom, like most large telescopes need counterweights. And here's a close-up of them, which is also out of focus, but I think you can see that they saved some money. Instead of making custom-made counterweights, they just went to the local uh, gym, Gold's Gym, and bought some, I don't know, 10 and 25 pound weights and made their counterweights with that. Okay, so I mentioned that the original dome was uh, damaged in World War II. Uh, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you can see this, this statue of General Wolf is right by the dome. And uh, if you look at the large picture of the statue, you can see that the pedestal was damaged uh, by a V-1 rocket in World War II. So, uh, as far as the observatory goes, for my money, that was too close. But uh, everything survived uh, to, to the greatest extent. Um, now, the statue of General Wolf is there, as it states on the left, because he fought a battle. And that victory brought the Canada and the American colonies under the British crown in 1759, under the British crown. However, we know, you and I know, that was just temporary, OK? But he got a statue anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, next, this is another building. This is a much older building. Used to be an observatory, as you can see on the dome. Uh, it's now just a museum. And um, uh, it was closed when I was there, so I wasn't able to get any pictures inside. Uh, I don't know why it was closed, but it was. Now, uh, you can see the yellow arrow pointing the lower right-hand corner. That is a, a mock-up of a plastic observatory dome. And in it is a piece of one of William Herschel's very large telescopes. And uh, here you can see a drawing of what that large telescope looked like. It was, uh, what did it say here? It was a meter across, 40 feet long. And I think it was about a meter across. I'm looking, it must say it there somewhere. Anyway, um, and uh, as you can see, they needed that big uh, construction to, uh, to manage it. Here are some photographs. On the right, you can see uh, uh, I, I stuck my camera underneath that plexiglass glass dome to take the picture of it. So it's about a piece of the telescope, about eight feet long. On the left, you can see before they put it in the dome, you can see kind of what it looked like. Again, it's just a piece of that 40 foot telescope in the, in the middle on the bottom, you can see a model of it. Uh, there you go, a 48 inch mirror. So greater than a mirror, greater than a meter. Uh, and he had it there for quite some years. Now, he discovered the planet Uranus, but this is not the telescope he did it with. He did it with, I think, a, a homemade six-inch telescope, um, 1781. So, uh, but they kept that there uh, for their museum. Now, uh, I've shown you a couple of telescopes, but the observatory has had many, many, many telescopes over the centuries. Here is just a couple of them. Believe me, just a couple of them. Uh, various kinds. Uh, commonly, they were these transit circles because they were interested in looking at the meridian. Okay, and as you can see, very different designs. Some of them go in the, even in the 20th century, and uh, but some of them going back to the 1600s. And uh, there's just too many of them for me to show you uh, uh, in detail. Uh, an awful lot of telescopes there. Now, um, uh, here's some brief history. Uh, just to, to fill in some blanks if you might have some questions. Uh, the observatory had been there for a long time. In the 1920s, you know, technology was happening and any of their electronic equipment, especially compasses, were being thrown off by a local power station and electric trains uh, for, for, many, for many, many years. That was not a problem in the 20s. 
that started to be a problem. They had to uh, make some changes to uh, uh, take care of that problem. Uh, in the 1940s, I think you'll understand, uh, they started to suffer from light pollution and air pollution. Uh, there was a lot of coal being burned in uh, England uh, back in those days. Um, 1946, the official observatory moved to a castle 60 miles away, and I won't even try to pronounce that. Hurstmon uh, Croissant or something like that. I'm not sure what that says. 60 miles away. And then, as I mentioned, it came back later. Uh, the last astronomer royal was there in 1948. The last real positional parameters to define the meridian were there made in the 1950s. Uh, officially in 1990, ROG moved to Cambridge. Uh, however, the observations were actually made at the big observatories on the Canary Islands. And in 1998, it was officially closed and now it's just a tourist uh, attraction and a museum. So that is, uh, oh, and one last, there is one thing new that's out there, and that's their planetarium. Uh, it's been uh, in there for 13 years, 120 seats. Works like your typical planetarium, as you can see in the bottom left. The people, the seats are there, and the people get a, a view on the, uh, the, the dome, right, on the ceiling. And the interesting part is the shape of that building you see in the upper left, okay? And the diagram on the right kind of shows you uh, this uh uh, axis right over here, which is this axis right over here, is pointed at the zenith. Uh, the slanted axis, which is on the other side, and, and uh, its apex is over here, uh, <clears throat> that points the, to the North Star. That means this surface, the circular surface on the top, is aligned with the celestial equator. And uh, the center of the building is right on the um, equal to the latitude of the uh, observatory. So uh, they tried to make it uh, very uh, astronomical in the shape of the building, which is nice than compared to just a normal old dome. All right. Now I have some a very short video to show you, about four minutes. So I have to um, get rid of this guy. And um, uh, let's see, go back into here, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, a new share. And I point at the here and I press the share button. Do you see the sign that says Greenwich Park? We do. Okay, yes. very good. Again, the, uh, the video is four minutes long. There's no sound. I will uh, attempt to narrate. Okay. So this is just the gate into that park that I told you about, Greenwich Park. Very, very large park. Very beautiful, very kept up really nice. And uh, huge areas, picnics, people playing. You know, it was, it was a June. It was a beautiful day, and uh, all these little British school children are playing in the park there. And I thought I recognized someone. I don't know if I'm right there. Let's see when it comes uh, any minute now. Yeah, I think that's Harry Potter over there. I could be wrong. Maybe. Anyway, okay. So here's the observatory. Uh, pardon the, as they say with the UFO pictures, the, pardon the quality of this. It was videotape, and uh, there's the shepherd's clock. And as you can see, the second hand moving. Okay, so it's uh, getting its electric pulses from the observatory. And if you want to know how much two feet is, they have a bar over there. Okay, so here's the view of London from the hill on which the observatory rests. There's the Maritime Museum in the distance and the other skyscrapers and things. Actually, there's the so-called Millennium Dome where they have uh, concerts and things. So you can see all this from the hill that the observatory is on. There's Flamsteed Hall with the big red ball. And I so much wanted to be able to catch the ball coming down. And you'll just barely see it in a while, I think. Don't blink. You might miss it. Because I didn't know exactly when it was going to come down. There is the zero longitude. Um, <clears throat> and they have a clock up there down to the hundredth of a second, in case you want to see what the time is there. Um, there you go, June 16, 2004, when I was there. And so there's the Prime Meridian, and they have all these other uh, facts. And there's that sculpture I showed you before, and uh, on the way to the Millennium Dome. And the other, who knows what that is. So there is, now we all know, is not the flag of England, but the Union Jack. Now I'm in the dome with the 28-inch telescope. Took a few little videos in there. And the, the, the plaque talked about when the queen was there. She wasn't there. You'd think she'd stop by to say hello, but she did not. So here you can see the uh, telescope from top to bottom.
just try to get the uh, telescope from different angles because uh, you have to get written authorization. So I knew I was going to be coming back in there again. Oh, so now you see it's moved up to the top. So it's after 12.55 and, and oh, I just barely caught it coming down at one o'clock. So the ships can set their clocks now. So there's what a, what a magic moment that was. Uh, they have a nice rose garden outside. And, the, and there's astronomical references to all these different flowers. Um, I didn't have time to really catch all that. So there you go, really beautiful garden outside the observatory. Now here is a little video I took of that piece of Herschel's telescope. Again, I snuck my video camera underneath the plastic dome. And uh, you know, it's uh, old and full of spider webs, but there you go, it's, uh, it's, it's an artifact, an astronomical historical artifact. And there's the other side of it. And there's what the dome looks like, uh, not a real dome, just to make it look like a dome. Okay, uh, and this is that um, uh, old observatory turned into a museum. And again, as I mentioned, I could only get a picture of it from outside. It's a beautiful place to visit. Oh, look at that's gotta be one of the world's best weather vanes. I thought that was really nice on top. And look at they make a fact they they mentioned that it's alt azimuth okay in other words this this telescope can actually move left and right uh, whereas most of them the observatory could not so that's why they named the building that <clears throat> and I guess that's about it for the video okay so again I'm going to stop sharing uh, Joe uh, can you hear me I certainly can. Okay, now did we want to do ROG questions now or do all of them at the end of the night? Let's go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll do them at the end of the night. And again, if okay. you have questions, if you want, go ahead and open up the chat feature within Zoom and ask those there. Okay. I'm, I'm collecting those and I'll call on folks as we get to the end here. Okay. I did so, have one question though, as you're going through this. Yes, sir. Um, so at one o'clock when the, um, well, A, how long does it take for the ball to come down? It looked like it moved pretty quickly. Yes, it, I would say 30 seconds or less. Okay, so does it, does it, uh, is it one o'clock when the ball starts moving or is it one o'clock when it reaches the bottom? Is it kind of the New York Times, you know, Apple drop in, <laughs> in Times Square? Right? Uh, I know it's 1255 when it goes up. Does that mean that, you don't want to know something, Joe? I think the answer is this, the clocks back then just weren't that accurate. <laughs> you know, they weren't working, they weren't worried about five or 10 seconds, okay? Right, okay. And uh, I don't have an answer for that. They said it goes up at 12.55 and it comes down at one o'clock. Okay. And the details um, are maybe forever lost in antiquity. Okay, perfect. All right. And you know, the tourists aren't gonna complain anymore. I know. So what are you gonna <laughs> okay, any other questions? None right now. So if yeah, if okay. You want to go ahead and start so, the other one. But that question says, "Doggone it, you were paying attention, and I appreciate <laughs> that." Okay. So now what I have to do is let's see. All right. Um, okay. So now I'm going to say share my screen again, and I think I'm going to do this right. And I hit the button, and uh, we see it. Here we go. Here we go. Slideshow. Uh, wait, slideshow, I said. So, and now you should see very old astronomy. We do. I love it when a plan comes together. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we just did old astronomy, and now we're going to do very old astronomy. And, of course, uh, that's my term. The correct term for that is archaeoastronomy. And I'm thinking I spelled that right. And we're going to look at Stonehenge, which I'm sure many of you have heard about in the past, I'll try to show you what I know about it, including the controversies, or let's say we're in England, controversies, okay, about Stonehenge. So uh, again, we were in London, actually my wedding was up in uh, Cambridge over here, but we stayed most of the time in London. And as you can see, Stonehenge is on the so-called Salisbury Plain, uh, which might have something to do with Salisbury Steak, I do not know but it was about a two hour bus ride from London to Stonehenge. And there was a lot of nice scenery. <clears throat> and uh, so here is a, uh, a drawing, a diagram of Stonehenge. Um, uh, so you can see all the standing stones. You can see the, uh, the ditches and the, uh, the berms, if you will, around it. Here's the sidewalk that they have for the uh, tourists to walk along. Tourists used to go right into Stonehenge. I'll explain later. There's a whole bunch of reasons why they don't do that. 
Um, you have these so-called sarsen stones and the, the blue stones, and I'll show you more of that. You have these one, you have these other stones, one, two, uh, let's see, where are they? Uh, one, two, three, four, these other stones around here, and I'll explain all of that. Here is the so-called avenue. Uh, you'll see more of that. And the, the heel stone, which is important for all the astronomical significance, and the highway, uh, which is <laughs> practically goes right through the doggone thing. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, Stonehenge wasn't built all at once. It was built in three phases over centuries. Here's the picture of the three phases. All right. Now, this is starting uh, uh, pre-Bronze uh, Age or earlier, all of these things, which means they had no real metal tools were found anywhere in Stonehenge. So stage one, uh, sometime between 2900 and 3500 BC, all right? Uh, this was before the Roman Empire. This was before writing. This is before wheels and metal tools. And they did what you see here in stage one. No standing stones except these two over here and, well, a few others, okay? There was a few, but none of the big ones, right? And you had these 56 post holes. Uh, now, they were holes. They speculate that they had posts in them, but that's only speculation, okay? And they're called the Aubrey holes because that's the guy who discovered them, all right? And so this stage one, uh, a lot simpler than what we have now, stage two, between 2900 and 2600 BC. And now we start to see uh, standing stones in the middle. Uh, the avenue was uh, widened, you know, like what they do with on I-10 every once in a while, okay? And uh, then you see these four stones here, which are called the station stones. We'll talk about them some more. And um, that was stage two. And then on the bottom, you can see stage three between 2600 and 1600 BC about the same time the Egyptian pyramids were built. And then that's when the largest stones were there. And those largest stones, so-called sarsen stones, uh, uh, 30 to 50 tons, right? So uh, the building of this, uh, the architectural term for this is uh, tricky, okay? Especially for uh, Neolithic Stone Age type guys. Um, so there's a little bit more of uh, stones over here put. And uh, now this diagram, of course, shows you how we uh, assume Stonehenge would have looked completed, which it is not today. Uh, you'll see it. But uh, that's just what we think the plan was, shall we say, of stage three. OK. So uh, then here's another picture, uh, more or less shows you what it looks like now. You can see several standing stones. Uh, they had when this picture was made, there was a different walkway for the look. Look at the, the tourists just milling around inside it. All right, uh, they don't let you do that anymore. Uh, you can see the fifty some of the fifty six Aubrey holes around the perimeter, and uh, but that's uh, a better picture of what it looks like now from a bird's eye view. Okay, here's another picture, kind of the same close up. You can see the new walkway over here where the fellow's standing. And you get a picture for the size of the stones compared to the human over there. And you get to see how much of it's completed and how much of it isn't completed, how much of it's there and isn't there. Uh, many of the large stones, many of the small stones. And um, that's what it looks like uh, from the air. OK, so uh, the, one of the most interesting things about, I'm sure you figured out 30 to 50 tons is not a weekend project. And these stones did not come from the local neighborhood. Uh, the large sarsen stones came from a place called Marlborough Downs, uh, 18 miles away. They did not have the wheel when they did this. All right. The smaller blue stones came from Wales, the, the far end of Wales, uh, 140 miles away. So um, it's a very ambitious project. You know, there's a lot you can say about that. Uh, they think part of it was uh, they took it on water. Uh, uh, they think a lot of it was uh, on uh, on logs, kind of like a wheel. You know, they put a bunch of logs on the ground and they rolled the stones on it. And then you move the logs from the back to the front and you roll the stone a little further. And you do that for 140 miles, I guess, more or less. So it was an ambitious project. Um, here's a diagram that tries to show you a little bit better uh, first of all, you see the complete circle uh, as if it would be completed. Uh, then, the, uh, as, it says, as it says on the bottom of the legend, the black ones are the ones that are still standing. <clears throat> the gray ones are the ones that 
would be there, but they have now fallen. The white ones that are just white inside are no longer there, but they can see marks on the ground where they used to be. And then this uh, says here lintels with a dotted line. And that's like this dotted line you see here and a dotted line over here. These are the horizontal stones that were laid down on top of the vertical stones, which you'll see more of. So this is just uh, just shows you what's really there and what's not there, okay? Here's another diagram of the same thing. You get to see the difference from the sarsen stones, uh, right? These, uh, the darkest ones, and then the, the, the gray ones, these blue stones, these are the ones that came from Wales. And it's just another way of uh, showing you what's still there today, okay? And, and of course, down the bottom, you can see it's, uh, 10 meters, so you can get a feeling for how big the whole thing was. Um, so here's a picture from orbit, believe it or not. Uh, I did not take this picture. I wasn't in orbit that day. Uh, and so there's that sidewalk. There's all the standing stones and all the, the ditches that go around it. And here's the parking lot or the obligatory gift shop. And by the way, when they were building the park parking lot, they found more <clears throat> of those post holes like this, or the Aubrey holes. And you'll hear more, a lot more about them. But nobody's going to stop a parking lot, right? So they had to put the parking lot on top of those holes. They figured they got enough for, to look at with Stonehenge, right? Mm. Okay. So uh, then here's another picture. Uh, it shows, you know, what it would look like if it was completed. And as you can see in the white letters there, you can see that the, the lintel stones not only were huge and had to be raised up, but they were curved to, to fit on top of the standing stones to, to make a perfect circle. Okay. So, you know, these guys were engineers, they were architects, they were, I'm sure they had uh, mathematics. I, I can't imagine them without some fundamental geometry doing this. And so I, I hold them in high esteem, whoever they were. Uh, here's a close up of one of the stones. And you can see underneath the, the stone, those round ones are the sophisticated tools that the Stone Age guys used to carve the stones. If you look at this stone, you can see the actual carving marks. And again, not a weekend project. Uh, on the right, you can see some uh, a lot of antler horn that was found there. And they believe that was used to dig the trenches and the holes and things like that, the digging in the ground as opposed to uh, stone. And then on the top, you can see a diagram of how they would get the doggone lintels on top of the standing stones. They'd have to first get the lintels there and then they would have to build the scaffolding and with a lot of uh, what's called elbow grease uh, and levers, you know, um, uh, raise the lintel stone, build a little bit more scaffolding and uh, what do they say, wash and repeat or something like that until you get all the way to the top and you get these guys over here using a lever uh, to, to raise the lintel stone on the very top of the standing stones. So a lot of ambition, a lot of hard work. Uh, I hope they got paid well. <clears throat> so uh, I started taking pictures, and uh, that's just to prove that I was there. I didn't get stuff off the internet, okay? Um, now, these are the figures I was able to get from uh, uh, 20 years ago, over 800,000 visitors a year. I'll bet you that pre-pandemic, in the before times, uh, there was more than that visiting Stonehenge, just because tourism, you know, is always growing. Um, they had a problem with tourists though, uh, as I mentioned that tourists used to walk right inside this circle of stones and they'd start chipping away at the stones to get souvenirs. I, before you say anything, I did not do that. I don't know if I thought about it, but I didn't do it, okay? Um, and as you can see in the yellow letterings, one of the reasons they stopped sending tourists there because people, and, and you may know people like this, they could not help themselves by having a beer bottle and then drinking their beer and then throwing it against the stone to break it. And so there are 1961, eight wheelbarrows full of broken glass. That's tourists, you know, what are you gonna do? You, you can't live, you can't live without them. Um, so you see the lintels on top, right? Gee, why didn't they fall off? Here's why they didn't fall off. Because the lintels are connected to each other with this so-called, with the uh, tongue and groove joint, right? which they carved with their stone tools. And then this so-called mortise and tenon joint, and for you uh, maybe woodworking guys uh, know about that, uh, 
so that the, the lintels stay very secure on top of the standing stones. And there's many, many other uh, monuments, uh, some of them stone monuments, but none of them have uh, this uh, technique. It's unique to Stonehenge. All right, so these guys, I'm telling you, every time, everything I look at here tells me these guys were smarter. And I don't mean just smarter than me. I mean a lot smarter. Okay. So here's another one of my picture. You see the standing sarsen stones, the ones that came from 18 miles away, 22 feet high, over 45 tons, uh, 18 miles away. Okay. So, um, and you can see the lintel stones. You can see one of the uh, parts for the mortise and tenon joint over here. <clears throat> now, these things, as you saw, some of these were built uh, millennia ago, and they're still, they look like they were done really last year. Uh, as far as the way they're level and the way they fit and uh, they did a great job <clears throat> i took a lot of pictures of the, oh this is uh yours truly and my wife again to show you i was really there uh and you can see the stones i took a lot of pictures of the stones and uh, i noticed something very interesting as i walked around and took lots of pictures and and i don't know if you can see it um but here's a nice close-up there you, you know they're not um they're not like shiny and new, but doggone it, I was impressed. Uh, I, you get up close, they're very impressive. But as I walked around and I took all the pictures, I noticed something very interesting. No matter where you take a picture, they look the same from every angle. <laughs> I took 10, 12 pictures, and it seems like every one of them looks the same. Anyway, um, so you can see this is a very ambitious project. You know, Stone Age people did this. People said, oh, they must have been giants. And then uh, after that, we got poo pooed. They said, oh, we think the Romans did it because, oh, they were builders, the Colosseum, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Aqueducts, the Romans did it. Well, this was here before the Roman Empire existed. People talk for a lot about the Druids, which is this, uh, I don't know, semi spiritual cult of some sort. Uh, they, uh, the Druids had nothing to do with this, so they didn't even exist when Stonehenge was built. And then, since it was so amazing, and the people said, we couldn't possibly do this, and we're really smart. So it must have been somebody who had magic. So people talked about Merlin, the magician, built it. Well, I'm not betting any money on any of those uh, theories. <laughs> uh, Stone Age people did it. Oh, uh, smart Stone Age people did it. So again, here's another picture. They just, again, all look the same. You can, If you look around, you'll see a lot of this, uh, the fallen stones, the smaller stones. And... Um, and uh, yeah, one of the stones fell over because somebody tried to build a, 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 a shelter next to one of them, dug a hole next to it, and that was a bad idea. Um, uh, but in the 1950s, they tried to pick up some of the fallen ones to, you know, make it look good for the tourists. And uh, <coughs> so uh, that's what it looks like now. And uh, there's a beautiful example of a lintel on top of the two sarsen stones. Just carving that lintel, to my mind, was a work of art. And uh, notice that the ground is not even there. It's tilted, but the lintels are not. The lintels are level. So again, it speaks to their uh, talent, their skill, their ambition. Uh, there's another view of them. Awful lot of those uh, 40, 50 ton stones. Uh, then, <laughs> I don't know who owned it in 1915, but it was whoever owned it auctioned it off. And a, a guy's wife thought it would be cool, uh, maybe that was her words, to own it. So the guy won it in the auction. And for, for three short years or three long years, depending on uh, how it came to him, he owned it. And then he gave it to uh, England in 1918. So they officially own it now. Uh, there's lots of these mounds over here. And in my, I, I said burial mounds, but I, I, I think uh, what I saw was they, they, there wasn't stuff buried in them. Okay. And so there were many mounds. These, uh, it, there's a lot of mounds all over England that were built for various reasons, but th those are right around Stonehenge. Now, the reason I'm talking about this today is uh, I know you're thinking this isn't an architectural club or a stonemason club, this is astronomy club. And so I'm gonna to talk to you now about the reason why I brought this up at all is the astronomical alignments of Stonehenge. And the first most famous one is the fact that um, uh, here's the circle of stones 
Here's all the holes and the ditches around it. There's the avenue. And uh, on, on the summer solstice, okay, the sun rises uh, on a straight line from the center of Stonehenge to the heel stone over here, okay? And the winter solstice sunset is in the opposite direction. Coincidence? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. I'm not gonna tell you what to believe. I'm just gonna tell you that's the way it is, okay? Here's the same diagram and you can see the 56 Aubrey holes. Gee, that's an odd number, okay? Well, here's the point. If you put a marker on, let's say this hole over here by the 54, all right? And then uh, each day, let's see, each day uh, you moved it two holes or if there were posts in there, you move it from this post down to two. In 56 days, you'll come around once, excuse me, uh, in 28 days because you move it to two posts each time. You'll come around once, 56 divided by two, the exact length of more or less of the lunar monthly calendar, okay? Coincidence? I don't know. Also, the number 56 is odd, but if you did again put a marker on one of the posts and every year you moved it three in 18.6 years, not 18 years or 19 years, in 18.6 years, you can see the math on the bottom, you will, you will come around and that's the exact length of the so-called metonic lunar cycle where you know how the sun has uh, solstices where it moves north for a while, then it stops, and then it moves south for a while, and then it stops, right? And we call the solstices. The moon does a similar motion in the sky uh, due to its, um, due to its uh, uh, the angle of its orbit compared to these, uh, the, the Earth's uh, uh, equator, okay? And, and so he, he, it moves in that, uh, that cycle, north and south, uh, over an 18.6 year uh, cycle. And so is that a coincidence? I don't know, but that's what the numbers say. And then you have the four uh, station stones in this rectangle, and they point in this direction to the northernmost moon set at this location, and this direction to the southernmost moon rise. Coincidence? I don't know. They call that the major lunar standstills. Again, every 18.6 years, okay? All right, so if you happen to be at Stonehenge, and a lot of people do this, uh, on the summer solstice, and you're, and you're standing in the middle of Stonehenge, and you look toward that heel stone, which is in the middle of the avenue, when the sun comes up, that's where it comes up. And, and then if you go to the heel stone, and you'll see the shadow of the heel stone with the sunrise behind you, pointed right at the center of the stone circle. All right. Um, now you might say, "Hey, Bill. Whoops, doggone it." You might say, "Hey, Bill. Uh, the Earth's axis uh, wobbles, moves, and you know, like for instance, the pole star uh, changes, right? And so, how could it still be aligned up? I'll tell you how it's still aligned up. It's lined up because they moved the heel stone uh, in this past century to line up nice. But they know that where it originally was, it lined up perfect with the sunrise. Okay." <clears throat> So, uh, so all of this suggests to me that it was designed and built, designed and built because they knew astronomy, some of it. They thought it was important enough. I mean, look at all the work they did. This is, wasn't just, uh, what are you doing tonight? Uh, let's do this. No big deal. I, I don't care. There's nothing good on TV. No, they thought this was very important. So they did a ton of work, right? And they wanted to predict the astronomy and they wanted to communicate the astronomy. Now, I'm telling you this, and I, as I said on the topic, that's what it suggests to me. This was done before writing. There's not a single word, sentence, page uh, of any kind from this that where they would pass down any information of why they did it, why it was important or how they did it, okay? You just have to look at all this and say whether you believe all those things or not. So this is how the sunrise would look, summer solstice, looking towards the uh, stone circle. Okay. So, wow, Stonehenge is amazing, right? Wait a minute. Did I, did I, I miss a page here? Yes, I did. Okay. So uh, I might have blown it a minute ago when I went too far, but here's one of the problems with Stonehenge. 
uh, saving it for daylight, changing it for daylight savings time. It's, it's a drag, you know, what are you going to do? There's not too many Stonehenge jokes out there. Okay, so Stonehenge, wow, what an amazing place. Let me tell you something. Stonehenge is not alone. Here's Stonehenge over here. Here's a big ellipse dug in the ground called the Great Cursus. I'll show you more about that. Over here, this little circle is something called Woodhenge. I will show you more about that. And over here is a village that was built in around 7,500 BC, okay? Had a thousand homes in it. They think that this was either maybe the people who built it or people who just uh, lived in this area, uh, you know, before it was built. Okay, so the Great Cursus and Woodhenge, very near Stonehenge. I mean, it's almost walking distance. It's definitely not far. So here's a map of that same thing. You see Stonehenge over here. And remember the avenue that came out of Stonehenge? It leads all the way down to the, uh, the village. And then here's the Great Cursus, as you can see, close to Stonehenge. And then here's Woodhenge that you saw in that uh, picture. And then here's something near Woodhenge called Durrington Walls. And as I said, Stonehenge is not alone. So here's the Cursus. It's almost two miles long. 400 feet wide. It's a big, it was a big trench. You know, they dug a big elliptical trench, shall we say. And then at either side of the trench, there's two huge uh, pits dug in the ground. On the, uh, the diagram on the left shows you what kind of chalky soil they had underneath it. And these are uh, archaeologists digging it up to examine it. And the picture on the bottom is just a painting of what they think it would have looked like uh, way back uh, millennia ago. All right. So that's the Great Cursus. And you might say that's from the movie, but who cares? All right. Except that Stonehenge is down here. And you draw a line. And I'm not, I don't know exactly where the pits are. Okay. But you draw a line towards the pit that's on this side. And it points right towards the summer solstice sunset. And this line goes right towards the summer solstice sunrise. That same sunrise that Stonehenge is aligned with. Okay. Is this a coincidence? I don't know. That's the, but the, that's what's there. That's the geometry of it. Okay. And then here's the Woodhenge right next to, uh, down the street from Stonehenge built a millennium ago, at least 4,000 years ago. And it's all these circular, uh, rings of, uh, post holes. Okay. So similar to Stonehenge in some respect, um, built by the same people, maybe who knows. Um, uh, but it's right down the street now. Uh, okay, so I told you right next to Woodhenge is Durrington uh, Walls. Here's Durrington Walls. Here is little old Woodhenge over here. And, and this is a ditch called uh, Durrington Walls. Okay, and then look at this huge circle. Again, almost two miles across. And all these little red objects, these are shafts dug into the ground. Uh, they, they, uh, at, when, I, when I got this information, they knew about 20 of them. They think there's more than 30, okay? This, uh, the, uh, the uh, diameter of this circle is, almost, is over a mile. The shafts are 33 inches in diameter and 16 feet deep. They were built approximately 2500 BC. They were just discovered this past summer. What for? Don't know. Okay. So you can see Stonehenge, you can see the Great Cursus and, and Woodhenge, you know. So this one here, Durrington Walls, is the largest prehistoric monument in Britain. And they discovered it because people just never stopped looking in the Stonehenge area. I mean, there's people uh, studying it, uh, trying to dig things up constantly. But they used ground penetrating uh, magnetometers and radar because uh, people own some of this property and they don't want people digging it up. I mean, that's an old problem, right? You got a hotel in Rome and you, uh, the archaeologist wants to look under and dig up your hotel. People don't want them to do that. So they don't want them digging up their property. But they use the radar. Uh, and they discovered all of these shafts, and, and maybe there's a lot more. So this is a huge a monument. Uh, here's a, how they did the ground penetrating radar. Uh, carry it around in here, and you can see it's a contraption. There. And I was uh, uh, sure that there were no sheep harmed in the, um, in the magnetometer system, although this guy looks kind of exciting. Okay. So, there, so I, I believe the people who built these things saw a lot of advantages to building these things. They can predict their astronomical events, which obviously were important to them, perhaps for agriculture, perhaps just for uh, religious uh, ceremonies. I don't know. We don't know. 
uh, a lot of advantages, but there were some disadvantages. There was a downside to building Stonehenge. And this diagram kind of shows it to you. Uh, he says, now that we can tell time, they start imposing deadlines. So these guys invented the deadline. And, uh, you know, that was the, the, the scourge of our civilization. Uh, now, uh, I showed you that uh, Stonehenge was not alone. Here is a map of Britain, okay? Uh, I refer to it as a Hengerama. Look at all those red dots. Every one of those is a Neolithic monument or something of some sort in Britain. You, if you closed your eyes and walked, you'd probably run into one in a short period of time. There are stone monuments, wood monuments, uh, circles, ditches, pits, burial mounds, villages, all over the place. So the quarantine gets over. You want to go see some monuments? There is ground zero right there. I would head for Britain. Look at Scotland has many of them. It's hard to even find Stonehenge on this map. There's so many of them, right? Um, and uh, many have gift shops. So boy, oh boy, think of all those nice souvenirs you could get. So a lot of people, last thing I want to talk about is a lot of people say, you know, men, Stonehenge is amazing. These all the monuments are amazing. These Stone Age people, there's no way they could have built this themselves. They had to have help. You know, people talked about giants and Romans and magicians and all that. But some people say there was one way they could have had help. And that is extraterrestrial help. A lot of people, I remember in the 70s, they said, oh, it's pretty obvious to us that aliens came down here and built Stonehenge. Okay. And obviously, you know, I don't know if I agree with that, but, uh, and I don't know if you agree with it, but I can tell you this. I was there and I was taking pictures and I took a picture that I found to be very interesting up in the sky. <clears throat> now I'm going to show you this picture. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I will let you decide for yourself. Okay. And there's the picture. <clears throat> now, some people said, hey, Bill, that's a helicopter. I said, yeah, maybe. Maybe that's a helicopter. They said, hey, Bill, there's an Air Force base right down the street from Stonehenge. Okay. That suggests it might be a helicopter. That's true. But, uh, you know, what do I know? So uh, I'll let you think about that and the astronomical significance of Stonehenge. I have an extremely short... Oh. If you're disappointed you can't go there now, that you can't go see your own, you can get these stuff things on the internet. You can build your own Stonehenge. I think that Lego one would be small enough. It'd be easy for an, uh, an evening project if you're finished with all your uh, uh, your puzzles at home, all of your jigsaw puzzles, or fancier ones on the left there. And then the, this is just two. There's many more. Build your own Stonehenge so that you, you save money. You don't have to go there, especially during the pandemic. Okay. So let's see. I got a video now. Um, I have to stop sharing. Uh, uh, I've got, you got two minutes for the video, Joe. Absolutely. Okay, fine. So, so I go to share screen and, uh, no, that's not right. I have to get out of here and I have to change to my other video. Look, this thing stood for thousands of years. We can give it two minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, all right. So here we go. The videos and his new format. And here's the Stonehenge video. Come on. Okay, it takes a while. Okay. And then I go to share, right? Uh -huh. I go to share. Oh yeah, I gotta get back into, I gotta get back to you. Come on, I clicked on you. I gotta get back. Okay. Oh, I know I have to click over here. There we go. So now I say share screen. And here's this, I say point to this guy and I say share and I maximize it and I'm gonna turn the sound off. And uh, and then, so now- uh, It's going. It's going, okay, see the videotape? All right, so here's the bus ride on the way to Stonehenge. You can see it's right next to the highway. There's a map uh, that they have at the, at the gate and uh, there's some of the burial mounds in the distance, okay? With, I call them burial mounds. And, and there is the, uh, the, the big, the more burial mounds and there was Stonehenge, we just passed it by. We'll get back there in a second. And there they have a stone you can get up close and personal with, uh, like the Saracen stone, okay? And you get to touch one. This way you don't start taking chips off of the real ones. And uh, so then again, the, I just took a couple of videos. You can see the, uh, 
the way the lintels are just beautifully level and uh, you know, they're all a little moldy, all these stones, uh, but uh, that's what they look like close up. Here's the part of the mortise and tenon joint. Oh, we went past it. There it is up over there. Um, there's not really too much in this video. I just wanted to uh, try to, there you go. You can see the, the joint there up at the top. They carved that, those master architects. And again, uh, no matter what angle you take a picture of Stonehenge, it all looks just pretty much the same. I thought, you know, I'd go on one side and I'd see something very different than, uh, no. Uh, it's all pretty much the same everywhere you look, but uh, that's what it looks like. It's only about another 30 seconds. There's all, there's uh, my wife. There's the highway. Just to show you how close it is. It's not out in the, oh, not out there. You see that? <laughs> yeah. UFO, I don't know, man. Helicopter, maybe. I'm no expert. And uh, I think that's about it. So um, there's nothing more to share there. It didn't land or anything like that. Uh, no laser beams, okay? So I will stop the share. And uh, then I would say there was a screen that, that I won't bother to put up that says, thank you very much for your attention. I am ready for questions uh, if there are any. Appreciate it, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, I know we had at least one question in the chat room. Uh, Eddie Trevini, our good friend, Eddie. Uh, Eddie, did you want to take yourself off mute and ask? I don't hear him coming off. If yeah, not, Joe, here I am. Oh, there you are. Hey, Eddie, how's it going? Ah, I'm doing well. Thank you. William, uh, first of all, great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the shafts uh, that yes. were extremely large and i was just curious do you have any idea what the shafts were made of uh were, were they well stone? let me tell you something well, uh, there's two kinds of shafts you talk about when they dig the hole in the ground those are shafts they mean holes in the ground okay like uh a shaft you would dig to build a building okay uh and then there's posts that would go in the shafts some people refer to those as shafts so uh, whenever I talk about shafts uh, in this presentation, it's a hole in the ground. And they speculate about, you know, maybe in the smaller ones, there would be a post that went in it, you know, a tree trunk, and it, it, would, and it would be held in place in one of those holes, in one of those shafts. But uh, none, of the, none of the posts survive. All that's left is the holes in the ground. So that's what's meant when I say shaft. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. So Excellent what they're made of is uh, what they're made of is empty space. <laughs> the hole in the ground. <laughs> All right. And I think Bram had a question as well. Bram, are yes. you uh, able to get off mute there? Yeah. Hey, Bill, um, are the stones just sitting on top of the ground or are they penetrated into the ground at all? Uh, no, uh, some of them are just on top. Some of them are in a hole in the ground Yeah, to, to hold them up. And of course, they have to get the stone there, then they have to dig a hole in the ground, and then they and, and then the guy says, hey, Joe, uh, lift that stone up and put it in the hole. Well, yeah, I'm going to lunch. Uh, get it done. <laughs> so, you know, was, they had to use levers and and then maybe dig the hole out a little more and then put, use a lot of levers and a lot of work and maybe something like rope and 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 lower the, the, the largest of the stones into the ground. The smaller ones are just sitting on the ground. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything right. else? Mark Leiter, I believe you had a question as well. Do you want to take yourself off mute and ask? <clears throat> yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, did what? Do they believe that the 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 site was ever completed? And what we see is basically a ruin, or was Stonehenge just simply never completed? Well, completed is is uh, tricky. Uh, however, the places where the stones are missing, you can see the marks where the stones used to be there. But other than the stones used to be there, you don't know, for instance, if the lentils were on top of them. Okay, so there are marks where all the stones should have been. Uh, which tourist took off with this 50-ton uh, stone is uh, up for, for a guess. Uh, okay. But uh, the stones used to be there. So it seems to suggest there was a good chance that it was either completed or very near completed. 
so the the diagrams that you showed before were they showed the the full rings and everything that's just what yes. they think had happened that's well they, you say they think they have evidence there's marks that a stone was there okay gotcha well, so you know the, that's pretty good evidence you know nobody's gotcha. gonna fake the marks i don't think we did so crop it, circles, right? So wait, you know what? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Cool. So you're welcome. So when it was completed, man, that would be great video. Okay. You know, again, I mentioned it many times. I have such appreciation for their skill, their knowledge, their hard work, their persistence. That wasn't two weekends. They they it it was by the way, they were illiterate people, okay, but they were just uh, uh, determined to build that thing, to work hard and build it. So God bless him. Yeah. I think Don Adams had a question as well. Don, did you want to take yourself off mute and ask? Don, I can ask it. <coughs> All right. Don had asked, uh, at the beginning, you showed a picture of a groom with his bride. I was wondering <laughs> who the young girl in the picture was. Huh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm old now. <laughs> so they look like kindergartners to me. They were uh, very, they were, uh, let me think, in the eight, in the 90s, he was 25 ish, 20, 25 ish. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They still had a lot to learn. But do you know who they were? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I do. I know who they were. They were like a distant family of mine. Uh, hey, okay. I'm not going to go to Cambridge <laughs> from uh, Chicago because it's just somebody I heard about. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's yeah. Don was asking who the, the young girl was. They were some of my was, family. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Great uh, people I, too. I had a quick question. You said yes, the stone was used to determine um, where the sun would rise during solstice, correct? Yes, sir. So if they, you said they had evidence of where the heel stone was originally placed. Is that true? No, no, no. When we originally found Stonehenge, it was slightly moved from where it is okay. now okay. because X thousands of years ago, the earth's axis a little bit different, the sunrise a little bit different. And they said, Hey, the most important thing is tourism, buddy. We got to get this <laughs> thing lined up. Okay. So they only had to move it a very short distance okay. it's still in the Avenue. So, you know, it was a minor change. Okay. I was wondering if they knew where they, maybe the original they referred, location they referred was. They to it as, backwards. Right. They refer to it as stone edge 2.0. There you go. And then of course we have Pathenge in Columbus, right? So there, our, our observing location. There you go. Modeled yeah. loosely off of uh, Stonehenge. Just joking about that. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> it's, it's exactly what it is. From orbit, they look the same. That's right. All right, do we have any other questions for Bill? If you do, go ahead and take yourself off mute and feel free to ask. I have, I have a comment. I, I remember a talk some time ago where the speaker mentioned that the best time to go is the day before, like I think he said about five days where you get that solstice effect of the sun rising or setting. And he said to go the day before the day after rather than the day of and the crowds are ah. quite a bit better. Oh, well, that's very ambitious of course, uh, uh, but I, I love that idea to see it happen and it, you, you kind of get the feeling for what it would be like then when they predicting this and, you know, and they built the thing and then, and then on the day of it works. They, uh, they had to have a huge <laughs> celebration, you know, it's like when you're sharing your screen, you know, and you're hoping it's going to work and you're hoping it's going to work. Yeah. So I'm, that's a great idea. I, but you know, right now, nobody's going there and you know, they have problems with tourism. So sometimes they just, they just say, okay, we're not allowing tourists anymore. And then they, they changed the rules and they allowed the tourists again and they've kind of uh, come and gone on that. You know, after the quarantine, I'll bet you they'll open it up, I hope. Well, they built a gift shop, so they're committed, right? You doggone it, you're darn right. <laughs> I, I mean, as far as the, I mean, the gift shop is the reason Stonehenge is there, okay? Right. <laughs> Which came first. Um, all right, so do you have time for another question or two? Me? Yes. I gotta be in bed by midnight, but all right. that, I got plenty of time. <laughs> So if anybody has any additional questions, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Oh, I got to show you one more thing. Yes. Uh, I showed you those two uh, Stonehenge models you can buy. I came away from Stonehenge with one souvenir. See how big this is right next to my head? It's huge, <laughs> right? And I'm going to bring it in close and you can see, you can see it's a little Stonehenge. It's so cute. And, uh, and, and if you can see in the upper right-hand corner, there's a north arrow on it, 
which for the astronomical thing, you know, it's important, right? You got to know right. how to how to align it on uh, June 21st. So this is what I came back with from the gift shop. Okay. If you set it down with a camera, you'll be able to observe the solstice from home too, right? You know, <laughs> I've, this has been for over a decade in my uh, in my office, and I've never tried that. <laughs> I am I am now compelled to do it. <laughs> Let me know when you do it. I'd love to see it. Hey, I'll take a picture. All okay. right. Well, hey, Bill, I, I really appreciate the talk. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Learned a lot today. Laughed a bit, too. So uh, it was a wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. Oh, and, thank uh, you very much. It's a great compliment. If you learned something, that's a great compliment. <laughs> thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Yeah, certainly. And then uh, I wanted to also let people know that if you could see the screen now, we've got our general meeting tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So if you haven't registered for that, uh, please feel free to do so. You can go to astronomyhouston.org and we'll have a link for the registration for tomorrow's talk. Uh, we've got Walt Cooney, he'll be talking about cataclysmic variables. So it should be a, uh, an explosive talk. <laughs> Sorry for the bad pun. Uh, but again, you can go to our website, astronomyhouston.org. Our, our meeting is tomorrow night at seven, our general meeting. Uh, if you want do any of the social media things, uh, Houston Astronomical Society on Facebook, at Houston Astro Sock on Twitter, and Astronomy Houston on Instagram. And if you have any questions, uh, for tonight's speaker or anything in general, you can always email, email us uh, info at astronomyhouston.org. We'd be glad to answer any of those questions that you have. So again, thank yeah, you. Very I will much. be happy yes. to take pictures at any. Uh, excuse me, take questions about any time. And we Nobody can get uh, a picture. Uh, asked, uh, yeah, we can get uh, autographed headshots too. Frank, yeah, yeah, know, fine. Right? <laughs> That'd be great. That'll be a huge uh, demand. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Bill and Debbie. Before we uh, sign off, any last minute uh, words or? Well, first of all, thanks so much to Bill. And next month we'll be traveling again. Steve Goldberg is going to take us to Texas Star Party, whether or not we can go in real life. Okay. Just out there looking at whether they can hold it sometime next season. And so we'll hear all the ins and outs. And if we can't go this year, we'll know how to go the next time it opens up. Wonderful. Well, look forward to that talk as well. And uh, I'm hoping that TSP happens next year. The uh, El Dorado Star Party is going to be going on next month. So we'll see how things work out with that. And if we can take any of the lessons learned from, from there and, and go to TSP. But uh, if we can't make it there, then certainly we'll learn as much as we can from Steve Goldberg. So we look forward to that. So, all right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see you on tomorrow's meeting. So if, if we don't see you then, we'll see you next month in um, November, where we'll have the elections and then uh, the, the uh, general, the uh, novice meeting uh, November 4th, and then we'll have our general meeting November 5th. So I uh, hope to see you tomorrow, though. We'll see you then. See you tomorrow. Take care. Great job. Thanks Bill. a lot, Joe, Thank Bill. Good job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.